Welcome my friends, this is Maniacal Incorporated, starting off an episode for the first time in a while, at peace. Everything is calm. We're not in the middle of a war. We don't have a crazed murderer stalking the halls of our castle. And like I said at the end of the last episode, I'm going to start off, the very first thing I'm going to do is come over to our decisions, and we're going to call a hunt. I think this is the first hunt that Dunica will have called during his regime. So we will sound the horn. What I'm going to do then, after that, is probably take the opportunity to go on a pilgrimage. The army numbers are quite good. We're still recovering them a bit. We have a good chunk of money. And what I might do is use that to go on a pilgrimage. And then what we have left over, I'm going to begin using to improve some of the other holdings in the province, to add uh, markets to them, so that that will, hopefully, increase our monthly uh, income. Speaking of our income, our son Edon, who I think was captured in the last episode, is serving as our steward. He's not great. He replaced his uncle, our brother Laura, who died in captivity, but we did see a rather interesting character come of age in the last episode, uh, Conal, the son of the murdered Sophia, and his father Alvin was slain in battle. He is a 12 in terms of stewardship, so at 17 years of age, we're going to have him replace our own son. And straight away, look at the improvement that he has made. Gone from five years down to two for improving the uh, county development, I think, in Urvuan. So that's fantastic. He's already doing a great job. And also in the last episode, our son, Moel Kiron, came of age. He got a bad old dose of the leprosy. And he has a mask on. We went with radical treatment from our physician. And he's grand, he's fine, sure you wouldn't even know. You wouldn't even know. We're going to organize a marriage to Constance. She has, just like him, a high intrigue. I imagine, I can only imagine, that the leprosy is playing hell with his fertility. Oh boys, minus 95%. But she's lustful. Uh, so do you know what? She'll keep on trying. I don't, I can't expect any children from this this union, because of his orientation and because of both the health penalty and the fertility penalty. But sure, do you know what? Look. Sure, you know yourself. You know yourself. You would think it a creature from myth, perhaps a god disguised in animal form. It was the largest heart I have ever seen. Even after the beast was wounded, the chase lasted half a day. It is still an imposing sight, lying dead before me. So we have a couple of options. Its head will look beautiful in my great hole, or it'll be a trophy for my son, Lynchuk. What does Lynchuk want with a dead... What does a 12-year-old want with the body of a dead heart? What are you at? Um... Yeah, we'll get, a, we'll get a hunting trophy for ourselves. What will that give us? I imagine a bit of prestige. Donica, why why would you give your son a dead animal? Donica's gotten weird since he's been looking at the stars. The hunt is drawing to an end. We mount our horses to leave the plains behind as the servants prepare the heart and other game for the journey back. In spite of our difficulties along the way, the hunt went very well. There you go. We're invigorated. We get 150 prestige. Can't complain too much about that. And like I said, while we have a ton of money and we are at peace, I think Thunica will take this opportunity uh, to go on a pilgrimage. And by a pilgrimage, I of course mean a raid. Because... I didn't realize that we went on a pilgrimage so recently that we can't go on another another one for five years. Um, I knew we went to Arguilla at some stage, but that seems like ages ago. We can see that Meath is attacking Leinster, and I wouldn't be surprised if that is to 
conquer Leinster. Now, that's interesting. So Meath is expanding in. Uh, I think what we will do is send these guys for Ir uh, We'll So we'll visit the brand new holdings in Connacht. The newly reunified lands. I was going to head for Meath itself. Um, do you know, we could have taken them with 1,800 troops. And somebody has just been slaughtered. Our nephew! Our nephew had terrible trouble. He was captured in the last episode as well. So that's our sister's son. Ah, the poor lad. Uh, we've gone in. Connacht has risen its armies against us. I think at a bad moment in time. I'm not too sure how the battle is going. Complegon wounded somebody. Fail coup wounded a member of the ruling family. We're getting some new champions coming in. We've uh, recruited some new champions towards the end of the last episode. We've driven out Connacht's armies and we're allowed to now continue our siege of Ear Connacht. At our ease, we'll take a quick look at how the battle proceeded. Uh, Casper, Felku, Condlagon, Cahlon. I don't think we have many. Connell! Is this Connell's first day on the job? I think it's officially his first day on the job. He didn't do too shabby. He's in with some of the big names. I um, I split the armies in, in half. So I think all the crappy knights are actually over here, handily enough. So we're going to be able to recruit some new knights. That might actually push Conal out of the list. But, um, yeah, worst comes to worst, he's going to continue serving as an absolutely fantastic steward for us. Our raiding options aren't great. We're going to march the second army into Tyrconnell. We're going to bring the one that just got a bit of a hammering to... Uh, into Brefni, or will we? Because that'll actually start sieging a place that has no money. I don't really want to do that. Leinster has fallen. I'm not too sure if they have any allies that they can call in. That battle doesn't look to be going great for them. They actually have more troops than uh, than Meath, and what we could do, what we could do, is we could use this as an opportunity to to raid Meath. And maybe weaken their army. I'm not saying explicitly that I want to stop them from gaining Leinster, but if we were able to actually break their armies and prevent them from securing Leinster, I wouldn't complain too much. We have another killer in our midst. I thought we had escaped these murderers from the last episode, but this isn't. A murderer... Like Sean, a murderer that we can point at and accuse. The curse of death has fallen upon my court. A case of smallpox has been discovered. My poor son, Moel Kiron, is fighting for his life. How can you tell? How can you tell? The taint possessing his flesh is a danger to us all. While he remains afflicted, no life at court is safe. The physician wants to know how my son should be treated. We've already given him drastic measures. And look where that led to. Uh, I'm going to say, should we say the choice is up to my son? Because, do you know what, he's a grown man now. He's 17, he can make his own choices. The choice is up to my son. Dovdal Kriok has died. The stress of the smallpox outbreak has gotten to our steward, Conal. You might be a high chieftain, but you are also an abhorrent knave. The unprovoked anger expressed by my steward comes as a complete surprise. Uh, he's been under a lot of stress recently, as have we all. It's his first day on the job. He's gotten a, a wife. And he also runs the finances of one of the largest kingdoms on the island of Ireland, so I suppose, I suppose he's under a bit of stress. Um, lose 28 stress. And we'll pause quickly. Kinaid, Kinaid's educator, Dovdal Kriok, our physician. 
I wonder is this connected in any way, make, shape or form. It doesn't seem to be. It doesn't seem to be. Right. So what a time, what a time to have to go looking for a new physician in the middle of a smallpox outbreak. We have a few good choices for the role of court physician. Uh, probably the most skilled person at the moment would be Cormac McQuillanon, our heir, but I don't necessarily want to send him dealing with smallpox sufferers. My wife Maria, on the other hand... I married Maria in the last episode following the betrayal of that hussy, Larthorne. She was off gallivanting with somebody else. And of course our wife Bardov also died in the last episode, murdered by Sean. So yeah, I think who better to give the role to? Uh, we also saw that she had a necklace with bones on it. I still don't know whether those were, were human bones or animal bones, but it clearly shows that she's good with a cleaver. So, do you know what? That's that's as close as you need to be to be a, a physician in the medieval world. So, we will appoint her as court physician. She gets a tenor for her troubles. Uh, the other thing that I'm actually going to do, I was looking around for things to expand... And I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot that we can actually expand the tribal holding itself. So it's a, it's a major investment. We do have some money coming in, however, with our raiders. Hopefully, uh, 200 gold, 400 prestige. So at the moment, we have the sign of the devil in terms of prestige. So uh, this will knock it down a bit. It'll be four years. It'll be four years. And I think we're just about seven months out from... You know what? I'll bring it up. Uh, we are seven months out from getting Banus, and I'll probably devote him to uh, helping with this one then, so we'll be both uh, fascinated and exposed. And we'll get that finished, and then, uh, then we can concentrate on something else. It's only eight years, and the king is, is 61. Yeah, he'll be... He'll be concentrating on something else. Yeah, absolutely. Surely Cormac is urging our son, Moil Kiron, to pray to Saint Botigifa. While our physician is actually trying to treat him. And our troops are marching, and you know where they're marching. They are marching into Mead. The capital itself has already been sieged down uh, recently. The reason that I'm coming in is because the we got a bit of intelligence that the Chieftain's army is located in the Irish Sea. So I'm confident that if we begin sieging the place... How many times have I been confident before? If we start sieging the place and the King lands his armies, or the, um, the Duke of Mead lands his armies, uh, we should be able to fight them off with that penalty that they have already. The prayers and the treatments are causing a pop-up. It is time to decide how to treat Moel Kiron's smallpox. I would recommend drastic measures. Well, Maria, you are the one with a necklace of bones hanging around your neck. If you suggest drastic measures, we will carry out on your first day on the job. Drastic measures. Disastrous mystery. While I can certainly see that the face is Moelkiron's, it still looks nothing like him. He is no longer there. The rest of the body is wrapped up in a thick shroud covering the grisly details of High Chieftess Maria's failure. The vile physician is standing in the corner of the room, anxiously wringing her hands. Our son has died due to a botched treatment performed by High Chieftess Maria of Munster at 17 years of age. In all fairness, in all honesty, in all honesty, we all knew the risks. This was, this was not looking good. The poor lad. Uh, leper, disfigured, smallpox, drunkard, that's understandable, uh, one-eyed and wounded. 
we all knew the risks. We all knew the risks. Uh, I think it's it's only fair that Muel Kiron also enter the uh, the Marthodology as a saint of insular Christianity. Uh, possibly the saint of, of smallpox sufferers. He handled death with piety and bravery. That's what the annals will say. Smallpox, a new day. The outbreak of smallpox, which has ravaged my court, is finally over. Its victims have all either recovered or departed from this world. My wife, High Chiefess Maria, ensures me that all bodies have been properly disposed of and that the threat is completely gone. So there you go. There you go. Uh, our son, our son died, but those who prayed to him were saved. Not least by the, uh, the work of our wife and their faith in Saint Welkiron. We're getting an all merciful amount of pop-ups. Oh, God. How could you do this to Gormla? If I have sinned, which I have, why did you not punish me instead? She was blameless, my perfect daughter. Life had so much more in store for her. So this is our daughter, uh, Gormla. She was married to the Count of Siena. We sent her out to get a, a suntan. She has died at 27 years of age from uh, died in childbirth. She has provided him with two children, including his heir. Uh, but I am thinking you know, we get a chunk of stress from that, 35 stress. So our alliance with him is gone. Uh, Sienna, he came and gave us a bit of a help with that, uh, with that, that Welsh problem that we were having. Also, another one of our allies in that war has passed away. Our friend, uh, he became our friend at a feast. I think in the last episode, or maybe the one before it. So he's after dying. However, our alliance has been reformed with, I think he must be our uh, son-in-law. Yeah. So our son-in-law, the new the new count, is still allied to us. It doesn't have the greatest of armies, but you're all, all help is welcome. All help is welcome. But there you go. Three important people in the life of the King of Munster, Donica, have passed away within just a few weeks of each other. Wrecked by guilt and stress, I think Donica would uh, donate money to charity. It's for a good cause. And he will probably use that money to have a mass said for his son, while Kiron. We lose 28 stress, so it's not too bad. God is generous. As are we. As is Mead. So this is what I was anticipating. Uh, Leinster's allies have actually landed and started sieging back down Leinster. Their army is larger than that of the King of Meads, the Duke of Meads. So I would expect that if he either attacks us or if he attacks Leinster, um, he's not going to be able to hold on to that region. I'd like to see Leinster remain independent for the chaos that it causes. I was worried about... Another alliance is gone. I was worried about Meath actually landing, but you know what? We managed to get off fairly lightly. We just had a single attack here in Connacht. As you can see, a lot of this region was already ravaged. It was like this before I got there. It was like this before I got there. I think it's still recovering, actually, from the, uh, from the last war. The poor woman. She was a tremendous ally. Uh, we helped her unify Iceland. She came down and helped us with things. But our brother-in-law is the new ruler of Iceland. And hopefully... Mm, not great. Not great. He's, is he the ruler of Iceland or did the area split? No, he's the, he's the actual Jarl and his brother then has one of the two counties. I think that's why the, the army... I think his mother was able to put together about 700 soldiers. Again, we won't we won't complain about it. We won't complain about it. 
we return with a good chunk of loot just as somebody becomes hailed as a virtuous bishop. Uh, the Bishop of Canop has increased the fervor of insular Christianity. And how much do we get there? We got 27 and 21. Not too shabby. Do you know what? We can't complain about that. Now, I will stand down the army. And you may have seen some pop-ups from time to time on the corner of the screen about new knights. So we're going to use that money to recruit some new knights to court. So after a round of hiring, our knights list looks a lot better. Here is the nephew of our ally, our former ally in Iceland who passed away. So here is his father. And there's his father's sister. Uh, so this guy is a cousin to the current ruling dynasty in Iceland. Uh, just recruited him. He's betrothed to somebody, so... Will we accept that betrothal? She's a lunatic. We might, we might see. We might, we might try and find somebody better for you. We might try and find somebody better for you. Uh, we also recruited Johan. A Catholic Franconian. Fantastic warrior. Brilliant strategist. So this is somebody who might very well be educating members of the dynasty. I'll probably get him to convert. I might actually demand his conversion now. And who else did I recruit? We recruited uh, Foylon. So insular Irish, not the best. But you know what? He can swing a sword, so he's grand out. And I also recruited a guest that was wandering around in my court for a while. Uh, he's a member of the family. Do you know, I probably should have recruited him earlier. Uh, he's some distant member of the family. He's not a great scribe, but do you know what? Sure. He's family. He's family. So that's pushed a few people out. Donica, our detective, who helped us to uncover the murders in court. He's still in there at the um, at the bottom of the list. So we do we do still have a few eights and nines, a couple of single figures in there. However, Crund Moyle has been pushed out. Bulcon has been pushed out. So we had a five in there until recently. Um, Cormac, I don't think, is getting back in. And do you know what? Do you know what? I decided it was time... He's, he's done his penance, he has suffered, and we will now allow him to spend the rest of his life in devotion to God. Uh, Gorrit, who wounded Daemon, the Earl of uh, Loch Lane, the previous ruler of Loch Lane. Daemon was killed a couple of battles later, he was severely wounded and was dying already, but insisted on going into battle so that he could have a hero's death. Well, Gorrit, we took him prisoner, forced him into the army. And you know what? He, well, he's a threat to himself, and he's a threat to the army now at this stage. So I've just... I've, I've released him from his duties. So he is going to take care of our wayward daughter. And um, his child with her and her child, Kenach. Oh, boys, look at that for a face. Kettle's entire family was rather angry with me for breaking that betrothal. But I promised to find somebody better, and I did. Uh, she is brave. And she has two claims. So, and she's not mad, which is also good. So the, um, the person he was betrothed to had a claim to a single county. Now this one has claims to two counties. And he gets 800 prestige. He should be delighted. He should be delighted. And somebody who has just been pushed out of our list of active knights is Corpora. He is of a lowborn house. But we will see that he is the son of Ocha. I think Ocha was one of the first knights that we... That we hired. He died of natural causes in 895. So I'm going to marry him matrilinearly to Constance, who was married to our son, Moel Kiron, uh, before he... before the medical mishaps. <clears throat> so we're going to elevate him, uh, Oka's son, 
to being a member of an actual house. Not the most Irish of names, but sure, there you go. There's going to be an Irish branch of that house. So now we have a well put together army, a well put together knights list, and nothing for them to do. It's going to be a period of peace. It's going to be a period of construction and building. We're going to see what happens in Leinster. We're going to get control up in Ossery, and I think we're actually going to put our martial training, uh, some of our knights, after that. And we're also going to see about uh, continuing to uh, develop our counties and get the development up, hopefully, the way it impacts research speed. I was getting a spate of pop-ups there about marriages and conversions being accepted, and then all of a sudden, I got Alliance expired. Our alliance with Minden has fallen again because our son, Crundmoyle's wife, has died in childbirth. So I found a, a new wife for him. She is of the house of Rogaland. Uh, she has the uh, the quick trait. We should just take a, a look first of all. Brilliant uh, stewardship skills in, in comparison to what we have at the moment in court. Uh, but she has the quick trait. But if you've heard Rogaland before, I am certain that it was this house that we took uh, Morgan from. So we are settling a decades-old score. And... Uh, forming an alliance between ourselves and their quite substantial military. So we will send that proposal. If we take a look at the history of Morgan, uh, here is the current chieftain of Rogaland. And if we hover over the guy that we uh, went to war with for control of this Welsh holding, you will see that he is a grandfather of the current ruler and a grandfather of our son's new wife. So we're we're burying the hatchet and forming an alliance after taking some land from them. We have just gotten the the Banis advancement. Uh, so that will give us a faster levy reinforcement rate. And we can see that Connacht has just pushed up into Brefni which I think gives them the entire province. They now control the entire province, so they just took that. Um, this area was under occupation a couple of minutes ago. I don't think it's changed hands or anything like that. We are, however, getting some religious refugees. So we are worried about the population of devout insularists in Leinster. We have a couple of different options. We could get an unpressed claim to the county. Fantastic, because we can't, we can't invade otherwise. As a tribal ruler, we don't really care too much about unpressed claims. I think what we will do, we could smuggle as many of them out as possible, which would give us uh, religious refugees. Levy size and holding taxes would increase. And they would get decreased levy size and holding taxes. The other thing we could do is get a hundred diplomacy lifestyle, which I think is what we're, we'll do. We will try and handle this diplomatically to begin with. He hasn't done anything that would make us think that he is going to be begin per persecuting the insularists. So for now, I think we'll just send an envoy and get our a hundred diplomacy lifestyle experience. It didn't work, however. He is suspicious of our intentions. More disaster befalls our extended family in Neustria. Here is our sister, uh, Sheila, who died in childbirth in 882. Her eldest son, the Duke of Flanders, uh, was slain in battle in 903, and now... The, I don't know what his actual title was, he must have been the Duke of Neustria. Um, he has just been slain in battle. And his young son is now the ruler of the duchy. So more and more misery being piled upon that family. 
I thought that Neustria was going to be an important uh, ally to us, that uh, we could keep that alliance going for, uh, for a good while, but it fell apart early, and now we're seeing the family being ripped apart. High Chieftain Dunica of Munster has abandoned his mortal coil at 62 years of age. He died of old age. Known to be a respected scholar, he spent most of his days studying in his library, rarely leaving his castle. High Chieftain Cormach ascends to the throne. A craven coward, it is unlikely that his subjects will respect him. I thought Dunica maybe had a few more years in him, but I wasn't surprised by this. I'd seen that his health was ailing. Uh, his health was poor. Uh, Cormac's health is fine. Uh, Cormac is just a few years younger than him. I'm surprised that they have described poor old Cormac as a craven coward. We'll have seen a bit of a split in the lands. Uh, Crund Moyle has gained uh, Desvoon, Edon has got Thuavun, and poor old Lainchuk has been shipped off to the overseas colony in Wales. And uh, there's not much to, to show about the lineage, I suppose. Um, died of old age, he was the cultural head, he was illustrious, he was a devoted servant. If I thought about it, I might have been able to get his his uh, piety up a bit more. Uh, he had the lifestyle diplomacy and he fought in 10 wars, 7 offensive and 3 defensive. We're going to continue on as Cormac MacQuillanon. 3 years, historically 3 years after he actually came to power in 902 and uh, 3 years before he historically died in 908. We're going to continue on as him, and we're going to see about getting a successor in place for Cormac, but I'm not going to play on as that successor. This run is going to be Dunica and Cormac, so we're going to see if we can hold on to what we have achieved, but we are going to have a little blocker in place, something that's going to be a bit of an obstacle to us. So we're going to continue on. And we're going to see exactly what that blocker is going to be. So there's a couple of things that we need to do. Now that the Bishop King of Munster, Cormac MacCullinan, is in power, the first and undoubtedly the most important is that we will right-click on Cormac. We will open the barbershop and I have the mods, you'll find them in the description below, the All Clothes Unlocked mod and the full barber shop. So the first thing we will do is we will come to the uh, his clothing. We will change that and we will come to his headwear. There you go. Cormac MacQuillanon, the Bishop King of Munster. And with that done, undoubtedly the largest and most important thing, now we can move on to some of the, the less important things. Sorting out our council. For our spymaster, I think, to keep him happy, we have a couple of powerful vassals, actually. Um, and the best suited for the position of spymaster is Moel Martin, who is not in the best of health at the moment. He's got an old dose of pneumonia. What are the rest of them good at? Nothing, really. The other two, they'll be demanding positions as well, and they're not much good at anything. Edon, your father fired you because you were so useless. Anyway, we will appoint uh, Moel Martin as our spymaster. And then we have our bishop. So again, as we have seen, I think, before, I was speaking about this, that uh, when, your, when your bishop dies, or when your bishop is elected king of Munster... The, uh, the game will basically auto-generate somebody. It has auto-generated a female bishop for us. Uh, because they are the rules that uh, Mandead has allowed for insular Christianity. We could put the former wife of 
the king, Maria, as our new bishop. Uh, most of the um, the people are actually... Well, the first two are female. We could put Gorris there. I was going to keep this position as one belonging purely to the Onuk Kashal. But now that I see him high up on the list, do you know what I think we will put? Because he's a bit better. Uh, he's an insightful thinker. I think we will assign Gorris. To our position as bishop, we'll sort out his clothes in a in a minute if they don't if they don't uh, sort themselves out. I think we're going to be in trouble. Like we're going to have to keep Casper there as our marshal. Um, we have nobody that can replace Conal as our steward. And when I'm saying that we have nobody that can replace them, what I'm saying is that like yeah, what are we going to do? Put Trondmoyle in with his five as our new diplomat. These two might cause us a bit of trouble. They'd better not. Like I said, I won't be continuing on after Cormac MacQuillanon dies, so this election doesn't really make much of a difference. Uh, if we were to elect a saintly, scholarly successor, I think it would be, rather ironically, uh, Finguine MacLaura, who historically ruled before Cormac MacQuillanon, so he seems to be the best suited. And I think we will actually support him. I was thinking of supporting Buokon. Just the way we could have Buokon pop up. The very last thing would be for Buokon to uh, to pop up as the ruler of Munster. I think instead we will support Finguine. Uh, I think we could get the other electors uh, to support him. Actually, somebody supporting him already. Quite handy. Now... Here's something interesting. If we order by learning skill, we can actually see that there is somebody with a higher learning than everybody. Countess Ben Ulla. And she is described as our lover. Now, she is ill at the moment. Um, she is one of the, the numerous daughters of Donica, who had the fornicator trait. So it looks like do you remember all those pop-ups about um, Cormac MacQuillanon being an exemplar of insular Christianity? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, we're going to support Finguine. Uh, so he is our new uh, player heir. We'll take a look quickly to see what the, uh, what the setup is here. I don't think... I don't think we've had any children by her. Uh, she has been married off to the Count of Brabant uh, to uh, to form an alliance with them. So there you go. Cormac, up to mischief. In terms of Cormac's learning lifestyle, I could just barely, just barely have asked for Bether. Uh, this is absolutely fantastic that he's finished off the Scholar tree. And I would have started coming down a bit of the whole body tree as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put him on Medicine Focus. Just to uh, to make sure that he doesn't die of old age or illness in the next episode. It'd be nice to get at least one episode out of him. And I think I'm only going to continue down. That'll keep us in uh, the learning lifestyle for a while. So I might, I might wander over in this direction. What could we get? I think we can get about three. I'm not, I don't want to finish off this, uh, this entire tree. All I want is restraint, which will allow us to embrace celibacy. And the reason for that is because historically, Cormac MacQuillanon was known to be chaste. Uh, he was a, he was famous for his piety, for his um, saintliness. When he was killed in battle in 908, his head was cut off, or there's one story that his head was cut off and it was brought to the High King of Ireland, uh, Flan Sinna. And Flan looked at the head and said, this is an evil deed. It was wrong that his head had been cut off 
And as a sign of uh, repentance, and as a sign of respect, he... I think the phrase is he carried the head about him three times, or he kind of turned around with the head three times. There's uh, there's all these traditions about, uh, in various different cultures, of uh, circling a king three times as a sign of um, kind of devotion or a sign of respect or whatever. So this was Flancina paying respect to Cormac Macquillanon and to the uh, the reputation that he had as a saint and as a as a saintly figure. He wasn't a saint, but as a saintly figure, as a devout figure. So I'm going to try and emulate that. I'm trying to get him. We might break off that uh, that that flirtation with Ben Ulla. She's a, oh, she's a devil. And you may have been seeing this pop up with the last couple of episodes. You are not married. You have no spouse. And it's going to stay that way. So he's not going to get married. I'm going to, uh, to have him take the, uh, the celibacy trait. Now, after he takes the celibacy trait, maybe then, if in desperate need, we could marry to form some alliances. But in general, I'm going to see if I can hold out for the last couple of years of Cormac McQuillanon's life. He's 55 and he's in good health. We could easily get another 15 years out of him. But uh, we're going to see if we can hold on without any alliances. If we can hold on to what we have. If we can prevent the region from splintering apart. Uh, which was why I was trying to get some money together and try and really build up our capital because I knew that's what we were going to be left with. And in the next episode, I think we're going to have to start as all Irish rulers would have with an introductory raid, a visit to see the neighbours, to collect some cattle, and to let them know that there may be a new ruler in power, but they are just as strong and as stable as the previous one. So there you go, after a long and successful career which saw him unite Munster, and expand and establish a foothold in Wales. Donica Macdovdalberin has died. We have indeed managed to stabilise Munster, uh, to keep it together and prevent it from collapsing, as happened historically. Well, so far, so far, it technically started on its downward tra trajectory under uh, Cormac, so that could happen yet. Uh, thank you for joining me on this episode. If you've made it this far, please think about giving the video a like. It helps to feed the YouTube algorithm and summon more people who might be interested in these antics uh, to watch. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, for joining me on the video. Check the description below for links to the Tip Volume 2 mod, which I'm using, and also the other mods which have allowed me to dress my ruler up as a bishop. And I will see you on the next one as we begin Cormac MacQuillanon's inaugural raid.